Um, so our main agenda item, uh, first of all, I'll call the meeting to order a Senate State Government Finance Policy and Elections Committee, today being Wednesday, April 7th, 2021. Glad to have you all here today. I appreciate it. So our agenda item today is Senate File 1831. And as you know, the underlying was a vehicle bill that uh, Representative Nelson and myself <clears throat> agreed to. And so we will be using today the A2 delete all amendment. This was posted yesterday and was walked through by all three of our staff. People walked it through yesterday. And then we also had quite a list of testifiers yesterday. So for today, I'm going to move the A2 amendment to Senate file 1831. All those, um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails and is adopted. Uh, then I will also move the A16 amendment. And members, this is some cleanup language or some additional language for the lottery privacy bill that we negotiated uh, with the lottery, pri lottery board and also with my house author as well. And so that um, that is part of this amendment. And then also... Uh, the Legislative Budget Office uh, was Senate File 2279. We heard this language already. Uh, we moved it out of committee yesterday. Uh, it went to civil law, uh, but they said it did not need a hearing. Uh, they already had heard uh, the underlying language already, had been a trip there. So those two are both good to go. And so I will move the A16 amendment to the a, Ms. James, is that to the A2 or to the 1831? Uh, Madam Chair, you can, the amendment, the A16 amends the A2. Okay, I will move the A16 amendment to the A2. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails and the A16 amendment is adopted. So members, now we have Senate file 1831 uh, in front of us today. And Ms. James, have we taken care of the motions and things? Okay, good. Thank you so much. All right, so we have the um, Senate file 1831 as amended um, before the committee today. And I will open it up to uh, members uh, who would like to comment or, or anything else. Uh, Senator Clausen, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to offer the A5 amendment. Okay, the A5 amendment has been offered, and Senator Clausen, you released this amendment recently for posting, correct? Yes, I have. All right, and uh, this was then sent out to the committee members. Was it has been posted? Was it also sent out in an email to the committee members? It was okay. All right, just want to be sure. So members should have it in their hand. Okay, uh, Senator Clausen, you can go ahead with your amendment. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment will add the language from Senator Housley's bill that we heard, which was Senate File 1786. And that uh, the Senator Housley's bill uh, established a permanent age-friendly Minnesota Council in order to help prioritize older Minnesotans in our state. And the bill did pass out of Senator Housley's aging committee. Uh, as many of us know, and as we see the changing demographics in our state, Minnesota is aging. Our over 65 population now is larger than our school age population for the first time in the history of our state. Also, uh, as we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, older adults have been really devastated by uh, COVID-19. They have suffered a disproportionate uh, share of deaths and hospitalizations and have been socially isolated for long periods of time. And our long-term care system has been challenged. And for those who have lost work or suffered other financial setbacks, age and ageism will make it even more difficult to recover. So given the situation that we find ourselves, aging must be a top priority as Minnesota recovers and older adults must have a voice as decisions are made that directly affects them. I'm 
pleased to say this bill uh, is bipartisan. It has the support of both ARP and the Leadership Council on Aging. Uh, the council really has, I think, three goals. One is to improve the lives of older Minnesotans and the communities that they call home and in which they live. Uh, focus and coordinate the work of state agencies, local governments, communities, and private sector with the goal of building a more age-friendly state. And finally, uh, to promote change at the community level with the emphasis on the structure of services and community features that support older residents, such as transportation options, safe, affordable places to live, a community commitment to health and wellness, and opportunities to stay engaged and productive. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'd be uh, open to any questions people might have. Uh, thank you, Senator Clausen. Um, I will go to uh, Senator Osmick. I think you had your hand up first. I wasn't quite looking. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Clausen, I see the funding mechanism on this is uh, federal funds that uh, are certainly not going to be planned in the future. Um, where are you going to be? I, I, I don't see any sunset on this commission. So my assumption here is that your intentions are that this this is a commit commission that goes to the into the future. Uh, where exactly are the funds going to be coming from after the free, so to speak, federal money is exhausted for this commission? Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Osmond. Uh, the council, I think, one, it's it's established, and people identify uh, that the worthiness of the of the group and the work that they do. I think uh, that it will be uh, really uh, added to probably health and human services, or uh, as uh, Senator Housley's uh, committee moves forward, uh, there would be an allocation from her committee on aging. Senator Osmond. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for clarifying. I assume that that was going to happen, that we're going to increase spending and we're going to take it from someplace in the future. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm not sure we do have, we, I believe you have budget targets now. Um, this, I mean, it's hard for me to believe that we do not we're not going to be talking about the tails, and certainly we have to. How does this match up, matter, Madam Chair, with your budget target? Well, Senator uh, Osmick, uh, in committee, the targets are not in effect. Uh, but the issue for me is there are serious tails. And for me to take this kind of language into my committee bill would definitely um, break the target in a very big way, uh, except for uh, in the tails, uh, so the ARP money uh, in the one-time expenditure, but this must have and will have tail expenditures and that would not be able to be included in my budget, it would not fit at all. Okay, uh, Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Clausen, so you mentioned this is uh, the 1786 at uh, Housley. Um, is it in its entirety or what changed in this amendment that you put forth that is different from the actual 1786? Senator Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator. Um, the bill was amended uh, previously. And so I've taken the amended language. The only thing that really changes from the amended uh, bill was the number of uh, members on the council where it's uh, restricted to 25, no more than 25. Senator Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's what I was looking for. I'm, I'm still reviewing the amendment in its entirety as well. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Curran. Uh, so members, uh, just to mention here though, um, that um, I, as a member of the Legislative Advisory Committee, the LAC, I have put a hold on federal funds at this time uh, for further review and further consideration. So dipping into these um, funds at this time is not an acceptable uh, position to take until I have more information on what these uh, funds would be 
expended. So uh, members, I, I don't find this amendment while I see this as a, a worthy goal. This may be something that is a very large uh, task taken on right now, uh, but I do not see us able to um, fit this in or to accomplish this. So I would not accept this amendment. With that, members, any further discussion on the A5 amendment? Okay, um, Senator Clausen, you wanna move your amendment? Uh, I would and just make a, a final comment as well. Sure. Sure. I, I think uh, we need to make aging a strategic priority in Minnesota. Uh, the majority of our population is, is aging. Uh, they have specific and special needs. And I think that uh, the council that Senator Housley has put together here in her bill uh, would really go a long way to addressing those needs and making sure that as our aging population, senior citizens, that they have uh, the necessary en environment in which to live and the necessary uh, resources in which to uh, last out their last years of their lives. So I appreciate that. But Madam Chair, I would like to move the A5 amendment. The A5 amendment being moved. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. And raise Aye. your hand. Aye. Aye. All those opposed, raise your hand and say nay. Nay. No. The motion does not prevail and the A5 amendment is not adopted. Okay, members, we're now back to Senate file 1831 as amended. Any further, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, I think there's there's been something that we have con considered in both bodies that uh, really is a more of an agency suggestion. And I would like to offer the uh, the A18 amendment, which is the safe at home uh, uh, provisions that uh, we have talked about. It, it has been uh, heard in committee in, in the other body, and it's really uh, more of an agency bill. But what it does is it offers safety for those people that need to have some security behind who they are and what information is carried in our records in the state. Uh, the uh, safe at home, this modification of the safe at home. Senator Carlson, be before you go further, you need to release it so staff can post. I'm, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, I've just emailed it to the group. Okay. All right, go ahead, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Council. Uh, yes, and, and uh, what it does is it allows the person to put information that they uh, I would say, see necessary to identify themselves so that they are not confused with another person and also so that they can make sure that they are not traceable for the purposes of stalking or of uh, putting their children at risk. So this is a, really a safety bill. It has no cost and uh, there's, there's no fiscal note to it. And it's really something that uh, I think is necessary to protect vulnerable people. So with that, I offer the uh, A18 amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Carlson. Members, discussion on the A18. Um, Senator Carlson, since you have um, just released this, it's last minute, and so um, I'm taking a look at this particular language. And, uh, and Senator Carlson, the Safe at Home program has been in place for quite a while uh, for victims of domestic abuse. This is not new, it's not a new program, and it's not new that people subjected to domestic abuse have this address confidentiality program. That is correct, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, if I might add on to it, uh, sometimes people need to have identifiers so that they can be, um, they can get their credit checks correctly. They can get uh, uh, communications with, uh, potential employers, existing employers, is something so that they are able to uh, to live semi-normal lives, and especially that issue with uh, making sure that children cannot be tracked through their parents. Well, Senator Clausen, that's all um, already in many cases something that uh, we have well agreed to. The issue here is uh, the language uh, of this. <clears throat> um, there are some things that I see here, the display and the landlord shall not display 
uh, is just a moving around of language in section 15. Uh, location data, um, I'm reading through it quickly at this time. So I would say, I don't know that I'm going to, um, it's just a fair amount of language and I have not just getting it right now. I'm gonna to go to Senator Howe uh, with his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess my question is on lines 4.3 and 4.4, .4, where we take out the names of other program participants in the ho household, and then it looks like we need to, sig and later in 4.5, we add signature of the parent's participant's parent or guardian if the participant is a minor. Does that mean that every, instead of the parent <coughs> with their children, and you'd name the rest of the household in there. Now, instead of having it just one application, you're gonna to have to put a different application in for every person of the household. Is that what that is driving towards? Is that the intent? Senator Carlson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess what I would like to do is I, I'd like to see if, uh, if Senate Council can help uh, determine what that intent is and what the result is, if that's possible. Uh, Ms. James, um, Madam, Chair and members, this... <laughs> Madam Chair and members, uh, let me take a closer look at this section. This is, um, let's see. Um, I need a copy. I'm not sure if that's, um, I, I'm not sure, I guess. Um, Thank you, Ms. James, I, I feel the same way. I'm, I'm not sure of the impact of this. Um, and, and members to let I mean, you know, when you're in the Safe at Home program, there are significant benefits that accrue uh, to a safe at home program participant. And, Madam Chair and members, I think that because this applies to everyone who is a program participant, it isn't probably necessary on lines 4.3 to 4.4 um, to tie the names of the program participants within a house to each other. Um, so that that's why that would be a, a change that they would make here to remove the names of other program participants the other program participants are already in the system. So um, I, I think that this doesn't have an, ef it doesn't have an effective change on the program participants or the treatment of um, their addresses or things going to those addresses, but instead just eliminates the tie between multiple program participants in one household. In, in their database, basically. So, Ms. James, does that mean that each participant now would need to do their own application then? Is that right? Um, um, Ms. I, Ms. I James, think that would I'm be... looking at 4.5. I think that's what that drives Senator at. Howe. Yeah. Senator Howe, would you please repeat that? I, I, I'm looking at 4.5, and that's what it looks like it it, it actually increases the amount of paperwork someone has to do in order to get their family enrolled in, in this process. Right, and it, it's also, um, it, it is ex, uh, location data unless the participant requests. So Senator Carlson, I think as you can see, this has got some questions here, uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I was wondering if uh, Senator Clawson could speak to the changes in real property. Do I've you been... mean Senator Carlson, possibly? Uh, thank you. Yes, ma'am, uh, Madam Chair. If Senator Carlson could speak to the changes, I'm I'm scrolling through this very, very quickly. And, and I just, I don't get um, some of the changes that have been made from county recorder to government entity. Um, 
that we have what's typically been uh, public information and but it's been private for these participants already and and I just don't understand the the objective that that we're trying to accomplish and if Senator Carlson could speak to that. Senator Carlson. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that this this primarily was su suggested by the Secretary of State's office and uh, I would like to phone a friend and have Sam Bonowitz explain it because uh, that was initiated by the uh, Secretary of State's office for specific reasons. So if we might uh, be able to bring in the uh, the uh, uh, Ms. Sam Bonowitz, I, I would like to be able to do that. Okay, that would be fine, Senator Carlson. Uh, we don't, it, Senator Carlson, by the way, just to let you know right now, we are in final adoption of the state government bill. Uh, we've already posted that we're not taking testifiers. So um, I will allow uh, Ms. Bonowitz to do, um, to give some explanation here, but that's uh, the extent of it, to be fair to everybody. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Ms. Bonowitz. Chair, members, Sam Bonowitz, Director of Government Relations for the Office of the Secretary of State. I apologize, I just was able to get on this Zoom, so I missed the tail end of that question, but I think there was a question about um, real property and what this bill does with real property, is that correct? Senator Carlson, would you repeat your question? <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm sorry. The question was from uh, Senator Pratt about uh, real property and uh, um, I believe it was how this affects the uh, having more than one person uh, under the program. Am, am I correct, Senator Pratt, Madam Chair? Uh, I, Madam Mr. Chair. Moment, uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Sarah Carlson, I'm looking at the changes in real property and I'm just trying to really understand the objective because it looks like we're just changing county recorder to government entity and we're adding some stuff to protections that already exist. And I'm trying to figure out um, on very, very short notice, what exactly is your intent and objective in making these changes to what has traditionally been, I, I'd say for most people, public information, but um, understanding that we've allowed these uh, safe at home participants to remain um, uh, anonymous, for lack of a better term. I just, I'm looking at the amendment and I don't see where the uh, material changes are. And I'm just asking for some explanation on what is so important about this, this part of the amendment. Ms. Bonowitz, is that clear enough for you to respond to? Yes, thank you, Chair Members. So this is a primarily technical bill. It clarifies existing laws and definitions, such as the definition of mail for safe at home purposes. It requires participants to submit date of birth on their general notice, um, just so government entities are able to protect the right Sally Smith. The bill also um, allows participants who submit a notice to government entity, which is a fairly rare occurrence, the ability to decide, to decide for themselves what information of theirs needs to be protected. Um, each individual situation is very specific, um, and this will afford participants the ability to control who knows and shares what information. Um, this particular change has really been driven by local government entities with employees that need this flexibility to decide for themselves what is and is not private. Just as an example, you have employees with public-facing jobs like county attorneys, probation officers, other law enforcement officers who may want their home addresses protected, um, but would not be able to fulfill their job duties if the fact that they're employees of that government entity is protected. Um, and then as far as real property goes, this is really driven by the locals again. Um, it clarifies that real property notice is not just a notice to the county recorder, but also applies to property records that are held by another government entity for tax and assessment purposes. Um, and that's the sum of the bill. Senator Pratt. Uh, uh, it is greatly expanding, so I share your concern. Uh, I was just trying to also look up to see if this was a bill that had been uh, submitted or because I don't recall us talking about this in committee. We didn't talk about it in committee that I recall. And uh, 
seems to have civil law implications as well. It does. Real property notices, civil law, a variety of other things that are involved here. Uh, signature uh, parents or guardians uh, could be a judiciary issue. And so when I took a look at it uh, in this year, which was a budget year, that is our focus. Uh, this is just policy, but this needs a great deal more review before adopting it. And that is why I did not proceed with it. I will go, um, Ms. Bonowitz, do you wanna comment on it again? Or is your hand up for another reason? Chair members, sorry, I was just going to point out that this was heard in civil law and passed unanimously in civil law. Um, that was my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this has had a circuitous kind of um, approach here. And I think with uh, more, Ms. Bonowitz, if you would take down your hand, because when it's up, then I don't know if it's previous or not. Uh, I'll go to Senator Osmick. <laughs> well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was going to ask Senator Carlson to explain lines uh 4.30 through 5.3 this is something that i think is what senator pratt was working on uh, i'm not sure i could get an answer on that because it's i had i i questioned madam chair whether this should be an estate gov financing bill um we have, we receive a lecture on an annual, usually on a semi-annual basis from senator marty on the senate floor and we continuously put policy provisions into financing bills. And I hope Senator Marty, if this does get added to this bill, I hope Senator Marty specifically points this out again. Uh, if this is a bill, this looks to be everything civil law. And I guess I will ask Senator Carlson, will you explain why this needs to go into a, what the reason is for this to be in a state gov ops financing bill where we are financing uh, the, the business of government and now you're dropping in civil law language that basically is a standalone bill that apparently went through civil law and apparently is going, you know, going through the system as it should. No. Um, well, why, why would you drop this into a financing bill in state government? What is the relevance for it to be in a state gov financing bill? Senator Carlson. Well, I think, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And uh, Senator Osmick, uh, there's a lot of things in here that are policy. And this is actually, this actually was a standalone bill that did go through uh, civil law and passed them unanimously there and was forwarded to state gov. And because either we didn't have time to hear it or we chose not to hear it, uh, we could have had this discussion in state government. And it was actually a, a bill that was traveling on its own. It is an important bill to those people who want to take it, uh, take advantage of this uh, uh, this safe at home program. So it's uh, it's one of those things that I guess you know we're we're kind of forced into doing it into this omnibus bill. The omnibus bill, as you can readily see, it has a lot more than just finance in it; it has policy as well. So this is uh, this is why it's coming up today. Uh, it was actually. Uh, I think um, if I am correct, Madam Chair, I think you requested this bill to come to uh, state gov. So that's uh, that's why we're actually talking about it today in state gov. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I, I might disagree with Senator Carlson on one point, and that is, you know, this was described to us as largely a technical bill. We've identified some concerns that broaden it uh, beyond that. And so I'm, ha I'm having a hard time understanding why this is such an important bill when it's been described as largely technical, but yet a lot of confusion around it. So uh, Madam Chair, I would, you know, I would not support this bill, but support continuing conversation since it did uh, make it through the uh, Civil Law Committee. Uh, thank you, Senator Pratt. And members, when a bill goes to a committee like civil law, uh, they look at a particular area, not the bill in its entirety. So passing out a civil law does not mean that all the underlying issues have been addressed. And that is why I felt it was very important to come to state gov because I felt the, there are many issues in here. And the question is, 
um, what to do with it. And that is why, because of it being the budget focus and this is policy, I'm willing to consider these kinds of things. I think it is beyond technical. I think it is more substantive than technical. And until that is resolved and some of these issues are resolved and we have time to do it, uh, which we do not right now uh, in this particular year. And so with that members, I would not support adopting the A18 amendment at this time. Okay, members having had discussion, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the A18 amendment, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. All those opposed, same? No. No, no. Motion does not prevail, the A18 is not adopted. Okay, members, we're back to discussion or other action from members. Senator Claussen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer the A19 amendment. Okay, Senator Claussen offers the A19, I think it was you said. Senator yes. Claussen, A19. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, it has not yet been posted, so we will have to give the committee time and the public time to see the A18. Madam Chair, A19. And, and Madam Chair, I've just sent it. Okay, thank you, Ms. James. It was just sent out. And staff here will uh, work on getting it posted. Okay. All right, Senator Clausen, I have the amendment in hand. Members, do you all have it? Good enough to go? Uh, why don't you go ahead and start, Senator Clausen? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. The A19 amendment strikes all provisions in Senate File 1831, which transfers the responsibility for Minnesota Historical Society Minnesota Historical Sites to the State Historical Preservation Office from Minnesota Historical Society. There is one exception to that, which is found on page six. It maintains the provision to install Minnesota and United States flags at historical sites. A couple of comments on this. Uh, this provision was not heard in committee. Uh, Costs associated uh, and related to the transfer of responsibilities have not been identified. Uh, there has not been a rationale provided as to the need for the transfer of these responsibilities. And yesterday we had testimony from Commissioners Davis, Showalter and Whiteworth that opposed uh, this uh, provision in Senate file 1831. Um, they believe that uh, in some cases they did not have the expertise to make that transfer uh, the costs were not considered. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd be open to uh, questions. Uh, Senator Clausen, question I have for you. Th uh, this kind of amendment just has a lot of delete here, change this, change there. So can you explain uh, exactly what your amendment is doing? Is this having to do specifically with state-owned property currently under the Minnesota Historical Society? Is that it exclusively, or does it include other things? Uh, Madam Chair, it only includes uh, Minnesota Historical Societies that are in Senate File 1831 that have been transferred to the State Historical Preservation Office from the Minnesota Historical Society, as mm -hmm. identified in Senate File 1831. Okay, Senator Clausen, I'm actually interested in considering this. Uh, but I'm uncertain right now because of all the page and lines and strikes and other things. And to uh, have us not go on a one by one by one line at this time, I would have to do a little bit of work on that. Uh, but I am uh, interested in considering it. If you'd like to lay it aside uh, for a bit so that you and I can talk about this, I'm certainly open to that. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. That would be agreeable. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, the A19 is withdrawn by the author. 
Senator Fate. I'm on mute, I apologize. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to offer the A6 amendment. Okay, the A6 amendment is offered. Um, this has not yet been posted or shared with committee members, Senator Fate. We'll wait for Ms. James. It's been sent. All right. Madam Chair. All right, thank you. It's just been sent. Okay, Senator Fate, I think members have the amendment in front of them. Go ahead and explain your amendment, Senator Fate. Oh, great. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I offer the A6 amendment, which would uh, simply strike this part of the bill. Uh, this is the Para and Murph dissolution. Uh, the dissolution has not been heard in this committee. And I think when we look in deeper into the into the consequences, we would, have, we would have seen a lot of strongly opposed voices if it had been heard. Uh, it violates the 2015 agreement between Minneapolis employers and the state uh, to fund the liabilities of the dissolved plan. Um, there were no Senate bills introduced this year to cut funding for MRF. Um, the Minnesota Commission on Pensions and Retirement uh, has held five meetings this session and not once have they heard legislation or even discussed uh, cutting MRF funding. And this is a bipartisan body that reviews all pension uh, related legislation. So they did not hear or pass anything related to uh, cutting MRF. Um, and this would also put us uh, in a situation or a predicament uh, in which uh, either property taxes would have to be increased or the entire para program would be at risk statewide, uh, meaning this would affect county employees in both ur uh, uh, urban and uh, rural counties. Um, I believe every member in this committee has also relieved, received a letter from uh, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, uh, the City of Minneapolis, uh, the Municipal Retirement Association, and the Minneapolis School Board uh, strongly are encouraging us to strike down uh, this provision. Um, in addition, in, in, in the tradition of um, uh, our commitments to retirees on a bipartisan on a bipartisan basis, I would hope we can uh, agree to adopt this amendment. Thank you, Senator Fate. Well, Senator Fate, first of all, it's a line on the um, budget document. And um, as a chair, um, I did not introduce a bill. It's a line on the document uh, in reducing uh, this account as has been done in previous years as well without a bill. It's a line item. And so uh, Senator Fate and members, uh, MRF, I see in the history here, the state closed MRF to new members in 1978. These were all Minneapolis employees. They're Minneapolis employees. And every single employee in this is a local government employee. And uh, some of these statements here, I was involved in the fact that this uh, MRF fund actually, before it was transferred to the state, uh, MRF was greatly underfunded. And the uh, employees of MRF, were looking to lose their entire pension. And not only that, they had no social security fallback on. This is one of those uh, where it was a unified uh, type of pension. So if this uh, MRF went defunct, all of those employees would also not have this pension, but not had social security. It was a dire situation. I was in the house at the time. I worked with Mary Murphy. I worked with all the entities uh, to rescue Murph in regards to uh, the Minneapolis employees um, running into severe. So I take issue with some of the language here as somehow the state did something here. Um, this was a uh, closed account that was uh, decided to no longer do uh, this kind of arrangement. And uh, when it came into para, uh, there were some situations, but that whole area, just remember, these are Minneapolis employees only and exclusively. The state has paid in a significant amount of money to MRF already uh, for these local employees. 
And I will stand by the fact that the state has uh, um, done very well in regards to this. I did not uh, get a complete history as I have done in the past, but this um, I, I will stand by uh, keeping this reduction and that the Minneapolis employees are the employees of Minneapolis and they should uh, follow their commitment to them in paying for their pension. And I do not agree with this, that the state somehow mismanaged this or, or did that. This was a purely Minneapolis employees uh, account uh, to begin with. It's my understanding, so members, I would not support this amendment. Senator Fate. Yes, no, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the, the way the benefits plan work, the, the whole plan either succeeds or it fails together because it is all within the same pool. So this would also tank para and hurt rural constituents that are currently working and that would require them to unfairly uh, be required to subsidize this. So we either have to cut benefits or increase their contributions as well um, to cover an unfunded liability. So thank you so much, Madam Chair. Yeah, Senator Fate, this is a fund. And by taking this action, it does not decrease anybody's pension. It does not put their pension at risk. Uh, this is a matter of how it is paid for, not pension benefits. And so um, just want to be sure members understand that this does not affect the pension benefits. And actually, the MRF account is doing very well uh, in regards to its uh, funding um, as it stands right now. And uh, the program as it was set up uh, was in a time where the account, uh, the stock market and bonds and so on were very struggling. And we did a very conservative plan for this and it has outperformed that plan. So uh, the employee pensions are not at risk here, nor is PARA. Uh, thank you, Senator Fate. Do you wanna make an additional comment? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I'll just like to request a roll call vote if possible. Sure. Roll call being requested, roll call granted. Uh, with that members, uh, any further discussion? Not seeing any at this time. So on uh, Senator Fate's motion, uh, on the A6 amendment. All those in favor say aye, raise your hand. Just roll call. I'm uh, sorry, roll call being granted. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Mr. Newbar, please take the roll. Senator Kiffmeyer? No. Senator Howe? No. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Osmick? No. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Coran? No. Senator Clausen. Yes. Senator Fate. Yes. You report the roll, Mr. Newbar. Uh, five no's and three yeses. With five no's and three yeses, uh, the A6 amendment is not adopted. Okay, members, further action or comment? I'm seeing none at this time. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm uh, concerned about privacy, uh, concerned about, uh, you know, and I think that uh, safe at home was one thing about privacy. And another thing is that uh, we have looked at putting out more lists of people, addresses, uh, who they are, what their uh, political affili affiliation is. And I would like to offer the A15 amendment that uh, uh, would reverse the initiative to make judge judges lists uh, public for examination. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why we don't wanna do that. And it also, there, this also would uh, include the challenged voter lists that would be- Senator Carlson, before you start discussing, we need to know the number and it needs to be posted. I'm sorry, sorry Madam Chair, I did, I did say A15. My apologies, I, I missed uh, hearing the number, the A15, okay. And maybe I can- And just a moment, on. Senator Carlson, just a moment. Uh, Ms. James, you have sent it out. Uh, Madam Chair, I have sent the amendment out. I'm, okay, thank you, Lexi. Yeah, thank you, okay. Madam Chair. That was what I was going to ask. Is if no, it, now you can go ahead and uh, do your present your amendment, the eight fifteen. Okay, um, 
what this does is it, it I think that voter information should be kept private. Uh, you know, what it does is it makes uh, uh, obviously uh, attaches people to their um, political affiliation. And uh, maybe in, in the case of judges, it uh, attaches them to their uh, local precincts, their local county, uh, and makes it uh, so that uh, some people can be harassed. And in fact, uh, I have to say that uh, it was a Republican friend of mine who said that he was harassed because his information was uh, because he had, he had signed up at the last minute because there was a shortage of election judges. And he was very upset that his name was being bandied about uh, by uh, by the party that he declared as he was affiliated with. The other one is that uh, when we talk about challenged voters, uh, there's a lot of errors in challenged voter lists. And when uh, one of the things that we do do is we allow people to self-certify when they go in to vote in case there's an error in their uh, in their challenge. And with uh, the bill that we have promoted here and is part of this bill, uh, and this is policy, uh, by the way, uh, this is not finance. Uh, and uh, uh, what it does is it, it makes a permanent list of people who have been challenged, why, who they are, how they were, they were cleared. And uh, it, makes a, uh, um, it makes a permanent list that goes along forever. And I'm not sure how many people that we have on challenge voter lists, but at this point, the uh, the challenge voter list has really no connection with uh, voter integrity or with fraud or with any of those. I think uh, we all know that this is this has been something that the has gone around the uh, the public um, public information recently, and. Uh, what we have is uh, a, a real, con I have a real concern that we're getting involved in some of the things that maybe cause uh, a, uh, um, cause voter concern in the state of Minnesota. State of Minnesota has had very good election control, very good control over uh, fraudulent votes, very good control over people who should not be voting and they get caught when they shouldn't be voting, and they're sent to uh, when they're when they are caught, they're sent to the county prosecutor to be uh, prosecuted. And um, what I found is that that number that gets sent and the number that gets prosecuted is extremely small. And what we're doing is we're trying to attack a problem here that really doesn't exist. And what this does is it's it relates to um, even back to Major League Baseball, where we had Major League Baseball is now going to a state where they have same day vote, same day registration. Uh, they don't create these kinds of lists. They do do mail in vote, uh, balloting and they are number two in the nation on voter turnout. So I want to make sure that we have confidence and that we exude the confidence in our election system here in Minnesota and that we also don't make people get onto lists that they really object to as being public. And so with that, I'm offering the A15 amendment. Thank you, Senator Clausen. Well, Senator Clausen. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Senator Clausen, what was that again? Madam Chair. Oh, sorry, I'm Senator Carlson. <laughs> sorry, Senator Carlson. I was looking down at the screen here at looking for possible members and I saw Senator Clausen, so that was the name in my mind. Madam Chair, I've, I've been called much worse. <laughs> I, I suspect all of us have. Thank you, Senator Carlson. I accept all apologies on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very kind, <laughs> Senator Clausen. Oh. So um, back to uh, the section here that we have. Uh, first of all, when you sign up to be an election judge, uh, you volunteer for that. You volunteer to serve as an election judge on behalf of a political party. And this is sent out. It is sent to the Secretary of State office, sent to the local jurisdiction who had a public vote of the meeting. They appoint their election judges. This is just returning the information back to the party chairs from which they were appointed from. 
so that they are able to be able to do that. And one of the things that increases confidence in elections is transparency. One of the benefits of Minnesota is our paper ballots. And that hugely impresses upon people confidence in elections. I remember before when people wanted to do pure electronic and I was a stodgy person who said, no, we're gonna do paper ballots. That's what gives people confidence in the election. And uh, folks have come around to finding out those paper ballots are a pretty darn good way to have an election and Minnesota does that. Transparency is very important. This is creating transparency that election judges who volunteer to serve on behalf of a political party, that information when they have served, and I've heard from numerous people, signed up to be an election judge or never called, don't know if their name was actually forwarded, what happened to it, uh, uh, party officers also do not know. And so this is transparency and to make sure that the duty to provide election judges and that information comes back only to those who have uh, had the responsibility for nominating, for putting forward those names and that they are serving on behalf of. So I think that's a very important part of it and to have um, that election judge um, information. As to the challenge ballots, I'm looking here at section 36. Oh, no, it's 35, okay, 30. Section 36, so it's on 104. Um, this is about, again, transparency uh, to make sure that everybody knows uh, on the eighth day after the election, the information made available for public inspection, the names of all voters who cast provisional, rejected names in whether they were. And again, this is transparency available to the public in the same manner as public information lists. So it's not, um, not available in uh, in the sense other than uh, the same thing as the voter registration list is right now available in the same manner. And in this case, it means the Democrat party, the uh, Republican party, any uh, political party, uh, public information lists um, would be available to, uh, this list would be available to them as well. It's transparent. Uh, everybody involved in this is able to know and to respond to that. So I think, and this is only after uh, the local units of government have completed their work. And so this is not something that just comes off of uh, the challenge in the beginning. This is when after the local units of government have compared these uh, challenged ballots to the court data, the um, public safety data, uh, the checks that they do for anybody else who registers to vote. Uh, this means this uh, data would go through that and those would be uh, corrected if need be or accepted or rejected, but it's not on the basis of any one person making the challenge. This is uh, public data or uh, voters who are in this situation. So um, only after that, Senator Carlson, is this list uh, then provided? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I, I do wanna bring up another issue that uh, is a contraindication of this. And that is that in, when we had this bill go through committee, uh, there was a felony level charge for uh, knowingly put a person's name onto this list. And that is not included in this bill now today. So we've gone from having a felony level crime to having it no crime at all for putting a name on there, knowing that it is a false entry. I have big concern about that. And yes, Senator Carlson, there, there is no, in this challenged voters, these are people that are challenged via a postal verification card being returned, meaning no such address and no such person at that address or other kinds of uh, challenges on a postal verification card. And then also from the courts or DPS. So this does not involve an individual who would make that kind of claim so that I felt that was an unnecessary uh, felony charge that we did not need uh, to implement this bill because there are no individuals in this regard who would be making those challenges. This is all from data, uh, public postal verification cards, uh, court data, other kinds of data that comes from 
uh, that kind of a government situation. So it's not, not an individual voter making a challenge. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you for that answer. I, I guess I do have a concern that this would open uh, that data, those databases to uh, people who would get in there and do mischief and would put people on this list and would uh, not be, they would not be visible to the rest of us. So I, I would still say that this is, this is something that is very serious and is uh, uh, actually uh, carrying with a person. It is a big brother type of list that will go along with a person even after this challenge has been cleared, after the voter verification card has been cleared, after the, the uh, sentence has been served, after uh, lots of things that gets you onto that challenge voter list. It is a, a uh, mark on your record forever. Thank you, Senator Carlson. But to let you know, the, again, these, these are challenges that come from not an individual person. So thank you, Senator Carlson, for your comments. Members, we have the A15 Amendment, which I do not support. Um, seeing no further discussion on the A15 Amendment, we'll proceed to a vote. All those in favor of the A15, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay and raise your hand. No. Nay. Motion does not prevail, and the A15 is not adopted. Okay, members, uh, seeing no further, Senator Clausen, I just need to say that and then, then you pop up. <laughs> well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer the A-12 amendment. Okay, Senator Clausen offers the A-12 amendment. I have no idea what the subject is. So I don't know whether to call on Ms. Daniel or Ms. James. I've just sent the amendment, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And the number again is Senator Clausen. A12. A12. Okay, I should just write those down as I go. I usually wait for the amendment in front of me and then I use that, but I don't have it in front of me yet. Okay, we um, it's posted and going out to you members. We're just giving it a few minutes to get there. Having your exercise this morning. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is another moving money around. Okay, Senator Clausen, uh, to your amendment, the A-12. Thank you, Madam Chair. The A-12 amendment uh, strikes operating cuts to state agencies and replaces with Governor Wall's operating recommendations. Um, the amendment also strikes public employee related provisions uh, that can be found in sections 18, 20, 66, and 77. These are actually Senate files 299, 411, 587, and 1256. And I'll talk about each of those, Madam Chair. Okay, Senator Clausen, um, I think you can proceed with that. I see no hands up at this time. Okay. These provisions will make it harder for Minnesotans to get the services they need from the state. This level of cuts will mean fewer staff, longer wait times, and higher long-term costs experienced as we attempt to pull ourselves out of the pandemic that we find ourselves in. This bill would harm public servants and agencies needed right now uh, to perform essential duties for the state. Some examples would be the health department that is responsible for testing, vaccinating, and managing the pandemic educators who are trying to keep our kids on track during the crisis, and the department administering unemployment and job related uh, for layoff workers. The bill only provides an operating increase to the Senate LCC and LBO budgets and either ignores the governor's proposal operating increases or cuts the operating budgets of other state agencies. The bill penalizes state agencies that have difficulty hiring candidates for positions in state government. If an agency's job is unfilled for 180 days, the appropriation for that position is reduced 
from the operating budget of the agency for the next biennium, regardless of the need of the position. This provision would incense agencies to hire less qualified candidates or let the positions go unfilled to avoid losing funding. And this can be found uh, in Senate File 411. It relates to Senate File 411. I think also uh, yesterday, uh, Commissioner Doty uh, commented on that uh, provision as well. The bill includes a limit on public employees based on population of the state, which ignores the challenging needs for services in the state. And again, this is Senate File 299. I believe each agency has unique needs, which cannot be governed by ratios or population. Another related provision that requires layoffs to be geographically distributed could be unintended consequences that could hurt the real public employees the provision is intending to protect. And again, that's Senate File 587. I think of uh, the Senate File 587, uh, there are issues as well as uh, PELRA employee rights uh, that have to be considered. Um, the bill would uh, prevent the state and collective bargaining units from negotiating in good faith because it requires employee contracts to remain uh, within an approved spending plan and would tie the hands of negotiations. Uh, that is from Senate file 1256. And I think it really undermines uh, bargaining and contracts negotiations laws that we have. With that, uh, Madam Chair, I'd be open to comments or questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Clausen. Um, first of all, Senator Clausen, you mentioned education, jobs, Minnesota Department of Health. This budget does not have any of those areas um, in this bill. Uh, so we have no jurisdiction over those entities. Just want to be sure members uh, were clear about that. Um, the LBO is um, an interesting situation because uh, in the two year budget before, because of where things were placed on the lines, uh, what we we're doing as was explained when this uh, appropriation article was discussed was uh, restoring a base that they would have been at risk of losing. And, and so uh, we were fixing that for them. The LCC includes um, funding for some disability provisions and the Office of the Legislative Auditor, uh, the LAC Commission voted unanimously to, um, to accommodate uh, the request for experience that they have there. But as to the rest of it, this, this motion would also um, break our budget target uh, by adding all this money, even though it is not a requirement of a committee, it is still something that I would not accept the A12 amendment. Further discussion, members? <laughs> See no further discussion. Senator Clausen, do you wanna make a closing comment or we'll just proceed? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I really think this uh, provision or these provisions actually have a long-term effect uh, if they move forward. Uh, again, cutting budgets at this time, um, there are some essential services that we have to consider, and I, I just don't think that this is the time to look at this, and we should really be looking at maybe efficiencies within uh, departments rather than just uh, across the board uh, agency cuts. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A-12 amendment. Senator Clausen moves the A-12 amendment, and Senator Clausen, uh, certainly uh, in the budget bill we have today, uh, even without this amendment, they will certainly be able to do that. Uh, members, uh, on the Senator Clausen moment, a motion of the 812. All those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Okay. Uh, those opposed, say nay and raise your hand. Nay. No. No. Okay. Motion does not prevail and the 812 amendment is not adopted. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we have some significant issues that are causing, uh, let's say, non-confidence in our election system. And I think some of those are really uh, a bit concerning to me that uh, uh, people are not aware of the, the uh, soundness and the honesty and the security of our elections. And what it's, what's happened is that it causes people to misunderstand 
what needs to be done. And um, one of the things that uh, seems to be a search uh, for a problem, it's a solution in search for a problem, is provisional ballots. And I would like to offer the A10 amendment. And uh, what this does, Madam Chair, and I, I think we can get it distributed. It's uh, yeah, I think it's only a one pager. Uh, it deletes the ability to have provisional ballots in our system. So Thank you, Senator Carlson, who moves the A10 amendment. Ms. Stangel, has it been sent out? Yes, Madam Chair, I've sent it. Okay. It's posted. Yeah. Thank you. And we're working, just a moment, Senator Carlson, we're working on getting it uh, posted. Just want to be sure that. Uh, yes, Senator Carlson, it is one page of delete, delete, delete. So I guess that wouldn't take a huge amount of space. Uh, Senator Carlson, to your amend A10 amendment. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, I think we saw in our, uh, our hearing of this in committee that there really were no supporters that came in to testify in, in support of it. Every testifier that we had uh, for the, uh, and it, it was paired at that time with uh, voter ID, but every testifier was opposed to it. And uh, what it, I think we, we also know that this is gonna cause significant local, uh, local disruption. There'll be local costs that we haven't considered. There was no fiscal note considered in the uh, committee. Uh, there was no um, uh, no information heard from the local uh, auditors or people that have to process these provisional ballots. And also, you know, I think it's very clear that when you have provisional ballots, and this is found by the, the Brennan Foundation and things like that there, where people do not go and clear them, do not go and clear those provisional ballots. And this is especially a uh, disincentive for new voters, for people with disabilities, for poor people that don't have the transportation they need, and for the elderly that don't have the opportunity to go and clear their provisional ballot. So what this is going to do is make a major change in the turnout that we have in Minnesota. And I think uh, that's reason enough to, to um, object to this, but it also promotes the idea, the incorrect idea, that we have problems with the voters in Minnesota. We have very, very few issues that uh, are have been brought to the courts. And in fact, uh, across the nation, there's been many of these that have just been tossed out. And uh, we have not seen any examples of this that have been, that or would be uh, solved with provisional ballots. Even though there's a lot of, uh, States that have provisional ballots, some of them are moving to remove them. And in this particular bill, we're also getting rid of same day registration, essentially getting rid of same day registration, because what it does is it, it uh, um, requires the filling out of a provisional ballot. And that provisional ballot takes several steps before it gets counted. So these are not going to be counted on election day. And this is a, a major disincentive for people to go out and vote and I think it's going to uh, uh, reduce the turnout in Minnesota for absolutely no good reason. So with Thank that, you. I'll sit for questions. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Coran. Thank you, Senator. Or thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, I, I believe we need to uh, vote this amendment down. We need to preserve the provisional ballots or install the provisional ballots, make sure that only eligible voters cast ballots. We're the only one of three states in the country that allow same day registration. And I believe that all of the identity validation and checks should be in place. It's what we must do to ensure that everybody trusts and believes that only um, eligible voters cast ballots. When a ballot gets into the box without those uh, preliminary or those secondary checks um, and true ver verification, it disenfranchises everybody. And uh, in, in addition to the Secretary of State continuing willfully um, not providing the very simple data, which would prove to all citizens in the state that only eligible voters cast ballots. And so I, I understand Senator Carlson has a great desire to have transparency. This actually um, brings transparency and accountability to the election process. And to me, it's the most critical component to our, uh, our state and the election process. In fact, I think you can look at the statistics, 65, 70% of all Minnesotans, Republican and Democrat, 
didn't trust the election results over the last four years. So this puts integrity back into the system. Thank you, Madam Chair, I vote down this amendment. Thank you, Senator Curran. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I would concur with Senator Curran. You know, when we talked about this provision um, several weeks ago, there was no proof that uh, provisional ballots would in fact decrease uh, voter turnout. In fact, what we saw in states that implemented changes to uh, increase uh, protections against fraud that, um, and, and, and quite honestly, it, it improved the integrity of the election system as well. Um, we actually saw voter participation go up. And uh, just, so for Senator Carlson to say that he thinks it's gonna go down, uh, there's no real data that would suggest that. In fact, the data would suggest uh, just the opposite. And this does give member, uh, voters a, a chance to cast a ballot that day. Um, 46 states have some sort of provisional balloting going on right now, uh, including the District of Columbia. And uh, Minnesota is actually the outlier in this instance. And so, Madam Chair, I uh, would uh, concur with Senator Cran, and I, I would encourage members not to adopt uh, the amendment. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Any further discussion, members? Uh, to let you know, members, uh, what's really important here is uh, we have uh, a provisional ballot scenario here, and this amendment would delete it all, and I do not accept the A-10 amendment. Uh, Senator Fate, your hand went up. Senator Fate, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so just this week, we saw um, that the MLB, the Major League Baseball, removed uh, the All-Star game out of Georgia due to the passage of new laws that have restricted uh, voting. And I think we can all understand the amount of economic activity that will now be lost for, for that Atlanta suburb because state legislators like ourselves decided to make it more difficult to vote. And I think that this bill would amount to the same amount of or similar voter suppression tactics that are beginning to be seen and noticed and watched nationally and beginning to be rejected by corporate partners as well. So. We should do what's right and expand the, the, the freedom to vote, not suppress it. Thank you, Senator Fateh. Senator Howe. Senator well, Fateh, would you. you take your hand down so I know that I have called on you? Members, if I call on you, would you please take your hand down and then I'll, I'll know that. Senator Howe. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and this keeps getting brought up with Major, Major League Baseball. And it's on, it, it, explain to me someone why they, Major League Baseball moved from Georgia because they decided to have a voter ID and they go to Colorado who already has voter ID. So is that the real reason? Explain to me why that is the reason of moving out of Georgia to Colorado who already has voter ID. I think it was a political move. I think it was it's gonna definitely be an economic move and it's going to actually hurt Major League Baseball for doing such a maneuver. They are going to learn, just like the NFL learned, that polis politics does not belong in Major League sports. So explain to me why they moved out of Georgia for voting in voter ID to go to Colorado that already has voter ID. Thank you. Senator Howe, is that a question for Senator Fate? You know, Madam Chair, Senator Fate could answer that, or Senator Carlson can answer that because they both have brought it up. So they can decide between them two who wants to answer. Uh, Senator well, Fate. Oh yeah, first, I'm oh, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Howe. Um, I think they did multiple things like banning, bringing water or food to people waiting in line, right? And also Colorado does have vote by mail, which I think that Georgia does not have. And one of the greatest reasons that there is distrust um, in the elections process is because propaganda that has been spewed by one side, including the big, the big lie that the presidential election has been stolen. And that led to an attempted coup as well at the, at the Capitol and that we've saw. Senator so Fate, please reason, stay on topic here. The reason why there's such a distrust among vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll leave it at All that. All right, thank you. 
Okay, Senator Osmick. You're once again, try again, muted yet. Sorry, I saw it, I, silly me. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Fate, for showing really your ignorance on what the Georgia law really does. Uh, you brought up specifically about water. What the Georgia law does, and I've read it, and it's being misrepresented by the President of the United States, what that law talks about with water or food, and I frankly, if you have to stand in line for two hours and you have to have a candy bar, it makes me question uh, how many calories you need in a day. But when it comes to water being supplied, the law that they put into place specifically says electioneering cannot take place, as in a bunch of people with Make America Great Again t-shirts and hats and handing out bottles of water that says vote for Trump within a certain distance of the, the, the polling place for people that are in line. It also specifically allows water to be supplied by the precinct that they go to. So uh, Madam Chair, I'm just gonna end saying this. This amendment is the voter fraud amendment of 2021 because voting for this, you are encouraging more voter fraud, more voters to come in that shouldn't be voting. So if you register a yes vote, say yes to voter fraud, because that's what this amendment does. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Osmick. Um, just to mention as well, um, the reports also are describing uh, states like New York and others considered to be quite progressive as having more restrictive laws than Georgia. So at any rate, members, we are on a Minnesota bill at this time. And um, I, uh, there are many discussions that we could have in regards to this that you have brought up, Senator Fate, uh, but you've had uh, two opportunities to comment already. So I'm gonna to go to Senator yeah, Carlson. My, my response to one thing Senator Osmick said, uh, Madam Chair. If Very okay. briefly. Yes. Yes. Um, well, different people have different health situations. So not many people can sit, sit in line for three, four hours. They could have a health situation that would require them to have a candy bar, like you mentioned, Senator Osmick. And I want to mention to Senator Howe and both Senator Osmick as well that Colorado actually accepts 16 different forms of ID, as well as other options as well, like mail-in. And they do not require ID for mail-in voting once a person is already registered. And I hope that answers your question. So thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Senator Fate, I think we could have a long, long discussion on this. If you please, uh, uh, just members, let's stay focused on our particular bill at this time, the A-10 Amendment. Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, to be honest with you, uh, Madam Chair, I think we should have a long, long conversation about this. And we really should bring in some people from, uh, from the counties where this is being... Um, uh, delegated to them to be an unfunded mandate. We don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know what it's going to cost as far as needing employees in greater Minnesota. I've heard from other, from counties in greater Minnesota who, uh, you know, they're reluctant to weigh in on this publicly because it, it would sound like it is partisan. So, but they will weigh in privately. And what I do see, and, and I guess I'd like to say to uh, Senator Osmick, do we have any proof of voter fraud? How many people do we have proof of? And I mean proof. I do not mean accusations because I happen to have the numbers for uh, 30 counties of, of the names that have been submitted for investigation to uh, determine whether they have committed voter fraud. And there are some counties that have said zero, zero people have been turned in to, to be prosecuted. This is a solution that is in search of a problem and we don't have that problem. And so it's, uh, it is something that is going to be very costly on the counties and the counties are still not, they haven't determined what it's gonna cost them, but they know it's gonna cost them money and it's gonna cost them employees. And when we talk about transparency, 
This is this is transparency. Let's see the proof that someone has been caught that this will be able to stop. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to make a comment that I thought Senator Osmick's comments to Senator Fate uh, was very disrespectful. It was really uncalled for, uh, making the comment about his ignorance on a topic. I think it was totally out of line. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Clausen and Senator Osmick and other members. Um, when you make your points, uh, you don't need to um, add those sorts of uh, comments to uh, make your own point. So a reminder to you all uh, in the Senate here. And there has been other comments in other ways as well, by the way, that other members have taken offense. They just haven't said anything. So um, just to let you know. Sir Osmick, briefly, otherwise, uh, okay. Thank you, Madam so Chair, just briefly. Uh, you are correct, Madam Chair. I have taken offense a number of times. However, I am a big enough person to uh, deal with the situation. That's what politics is. And number two, we had direct testimony from the Secretary of State of Minnesota that identified that voter fraud happens in every election, and this is easily researchable through a Google search. I believe the Heritage Foundation specifically has cases you can look at case after case after case where people are prosecuted. This is the tip of the iceberg, and these are just the ones we can catch. That is, thank you, yep. Madam Chair. Yeah, thank you, Senator Osmick. Uh, no, Senator Fauté, we're closing the discussion. Uh, so thank you very much, members. I appreciate that uh, in your discussion, and we'll proceed to a vote on the A-10 amendment offered by Senator Clausen. Uh, all those in favor of the A-10 amendment? Madam Chair. <laughs> so sorry, so sorry. Ma Madam Chair, I'd like to call for a roll call vote, too. Thank you, Senator Carlson. On the A-10 Amendment. Uh, by the way, just to mention, I wanted to uh, mention this, that we gave a healthy amount of money, $919,000, that are not itemized as um, appropriations under each individual entity. What we did was uh, have one large appropriation to cover uh, those expenses. So they're just, they're, they may appear to be just policy, but they are covered in another area. So with that, roll call being requested, roll call granted, Mr. Newbar. Please call the roll. Senator Kipmeyer? No. Senator Howe? Nay. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Osmick? No. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Coran? No. Senator Clausen? Aye. Senator Fate? Yes. Five no's, three yeses. There being five no's and three yeses, the A-10 amendment does not prevail and is not adopted. Okay, members, uh, we have session at 12 o'clock. Um, we can proceed to a vote on the uh, Senate file 1831 as amended, and we will have uh, a vote on that. So all those in favor of 1831. Do we have a roll call, Madam Chair? Senator Clausen requests a roll call. Uh, roll call granted. Mr. Neubauer, uh, please take the roll. Uh, just a moment, just a moment, Mr. Neubauer. Ms. James. Madam Chair, I just wanted to get the, get the motion right and complete. That's Senate file 1831 be recommended to pass and be referred to finance. As amended to? Yep has amended. All right, all right. That being the motion, Mr. Newbar, please take the roll. Senator Kiffmeyer? Aye. Senator Howe? Aye. Senator Carlson? Nay. Senator Osmick? Yes. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Coran? Yes. Senator Clausen? Nay. Senator Fate? Nay. Five yeses, three noes. Um, Ms. James, are your hands up yet? Was there something addition? Okay. All right. On the vote of five yeses and three noes, uh, Senate file 1831 as amended is passed.
and sent to finance committee. Thank you very much. All right, members, our business having been concluded for today, uh, please stay tuned. Uh, there may be further possible uh, committee hearings in the future, nothing scheduled at this time, but please stay tuned. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>